as we go through, we're going to keep most of the questions t towards the end, uh, but we may answer a few uh, mid-session, so if you've got any of those, please submit them. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do like interactive sessions, so if there are any questions you have, go ahead and submit those through the go to meeting interface. Um, I, I may take a break or two. We'll just kind of have to see how we're doing time wise. Um, this stuff's cool to talk about, but it's even cooler to kind of chat about because um, even some of the things that I've done here, there's different angles, different takes on it. So um, even if it's not a question as much as, hey, why did you do this? I, you know, I would have done that. I'd love to feel those as well. Um, and anything we don't get to today, um, I intend to blog on. So feel free to keep those coming throughout. So anyhow, this is my talk. Um, the, the longer title um, is Data to Impress Those Who Sign the Checks. And what this is, just to kind of preface this before we dive into a little bit about me, the agenda, all that stuff, is, yeah, you know, our jobs as data professionals are evolving rapidly. And we need to kind of look for avenues beyond the traditional I keep the servers running to maybe not justify where we're at, but show other ways that we can provide value with our understanding of data and maybe technologies that are that are on, on the edge of the core of what we do, but still things that we can understand and that can help our company, you know, do greater things and hopefully pay us more money, right? So my particular spin on this involves Azure Logic Apps sentiment analysis and uh, and basically looking at tweets and kind of gauging the impression of our company or a hashtag or something like that just off going through tweets. Um, and so we're going to dive a lot more into that. Before we dive into that, I want to share a little bit about me. I'm a data platform solution architect for DMI. Um, we do more than just data platform stuff. We've got app dev, mobile dev, full stack. Um, so if any of that interests you at all, you've got my contact info there for that. That's the last kind of vaguely salesy thing that I'll say. I will say if you want to provide feedback on this talk or if you think of a question later, something like that, feel free to hit me up there. Twitter is uh, SQL at speed. You can contact me there if you'd like. I believe my DMs are open there if, if you'd rather use that. Um, I do value any feedback that I get from this. So, you know, even if you just think this was the worst talk ever, or if you just want to send me a note that says you suck, I at least like a reason why, so I suck less n next time. Um, my blog is sqlatspeed.com. I actually refer to that a couple times in here. Um, there's some things that I, I don't, you know, we just don't have the time to really get into in great depth. Um, but if you're interested in that, I'll read you to a couple. server, I think it's that they're working with it for about 16 years. So I've come at data-related problems from, from a lot of different angles. I've managed data centers. I've worked on dev teams, managed those, been a lone DBA, led a team of that. So like I said, I've kind of approached things from just about every perspective that you can. Um, I was fortunate enough to get selected to speak to Pass Summit last fall. Um, just to put in a further plug for Summit, despite the fact that they picked me, it's an awesome event. If you've never been, you should go, uh, especially kind of along the lines of this talk where this is maybe not a true data professional area. Things like this are starting to be things that we need to understand. And 
I think the summit group has done a really nice job kind of folding cloud topics into that. So um, whatever you're interested in on the data platform side, you know, summit's going to have some of the very best folks um, and, and it's well, well worth it. Um, I'm also a home cook and a car geek and you may wonder how I picked my Twitter handle and website. Even if you're not, I'm going to tell you anyway. So that's me. Uh, that, that's what I like to do for fun. Um, and the, the larger shot is actually me at Indy uh, last summer. If you want to contact me and talk about this kind of stuff, as much as I love talking about data, I love talking about driving race cars more. So anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about what we're going to be going over for about the next 45 minutes here. So we're going to kind of take seven points and go through this. Um, so first of all, if, if, you know, if it's not a phrase you're familiar with, what is sentiment analysis? You know, what does it mean? And then, and then we're going to take that into why is it important? Why should any of us care about it? And then you may wonder how somebody who is kind of a self-professed DBA slash data platform consultant stumbled into this and why do I think it's cool enough that I want to share what I've learned. Um, and, and so that's that third point for you there. And then we're going to get into what I built, uh, kind of how I learned all this stuff. So that part, if you were an English soccer fan at all, may be of a little more interest than, than the rest of it. And you'll see why that is once we get there. And after I talk about what I built, I'm going to talk about how I built it. And that's where I'll probably refer you to a couple of my blog posts that go go into deep, deep depth about exactly uh, how it works. And then we'll hopefully do a little chat at the end and wrap that up. So before I dive into the first point, just to kind of set the landscape for you guys, I want to kind of show you in raw data form what I'm talking about here. And so this is, and I'll explain more, but this is the, the raw data that powers the EPL mood table. And so this um, this is a tweet where it's basically talking to me that was newly signed by a club. He hadn't scored. They had given up seven goals while he was on, on, on the field. You may not care about any of this at all. The sentiment score over here is what's interesting. And seeing this off, off the top is going to help the rest of what we're going to talk about. So the sentiment Sentiment score, and I'll go into about this. If you don't take anything else away from this talk about how it works, what's important to understand is that the score is zero if it's very negative, and one if it's not. So I'll I'll go into why I'm hearing all this and what I'm doing with it. But this is basically what the raw data looks like. So I'll go through kind of what this is, why I've done it, what we built, what we can actually do with it. That's not kind of a silly soccer podcast thing. Um, I kind of want you to keep this row in in mind. And with that, let's flip back to the PowerPoint and go on from there. And like I said, any questions at all that you guys have, feel free to throw those in. Um, and I may try to take at least one kind of halftime break to hit a few of those. So what is this? Why are we talking about, why are we all hanging out here for an hour to learn about it? So Google's first hit when you put that in is the process of computationally identifying and categorizing opinions expressed in a piece of text, especially in order to determine whether the writer's attitude towards a particular topic, product, et cetera, is positive, negative, or neutral. That's a very descriptive way of laying out what this is. What you know, how would I describe it to somebody without wanting to say all that? We're using a bit of magic to figure out how people are feeling when they tweet about something, which sounds like a silly thing, but with so much of really our, our world focused on what goes on on social media and how that, you know, drives things that happen in real life, a lot of us are getting to the point where almost regardless of where you work and what industry your firm is in, these are things we need to begin to understand because they, they have real impact to bottom lines and, and ultimately our lives. 
So let's get into a little more stuff that's not just bullet pointy stuff. So this is also known as opinion mining. So if you're familiar with that term, um, we're basically talking about the same thing here. The concept has actually been around for years and years. Um, and I don't go into it on, on these slides, but there were kind of, I guess, the early editions of focus groups and things like that. There were similar concepts and, you know, talked about. There were papers written about it, but there wasn't the computerized component that we have now. It was pretty much just people with professional training kind of laying out positive negative and kind of the subtext of what people are saying, you know, if there's a focus group saying, well, what did you think of that politician speech? You know, they could kind of dive in and, and read between the lines of what the people actually said. But that was that was driven by a person. And, and now we've moved beyond that. And it's gotten more important because we can get these sentiments, these statements out to the world so much faster. So once we hit the computerized element of it. Um, it is typically done with specialized tools because there are dashboards out there where it's been written just to do this. Um, and, I, and I have some friends that are fortunate enough to work with those. And, and what their complaint has kind of always been is it's a specialized tool. Everything in there is ge generally you know, kind of a black box. The company knows what's in there. They know the algorithms they've done those with you and any changes kind of require one or many of their engineers to come and kind of tweak it to your needs, which of course does not come without a cost. And so what's cool about this, all of this stuff that we're talking about here comes out of the Azure Cognitive Services API, which is actually a suite of things, which we'll talk about here in a couple slides. Um, but what it does is it's to the people. It's it's less of a black box. We can it much more. And we can deploy solutions built on this quite easily instead of having to say, you know, to go to our marketing team and say, well, I think this is important. And then you go talk to vendors and, and you buy something specialized that's quite expensive. Um, you know, this is something we can spin up in in, in a matter of a day. So what are the Cognitive Services APIs? Microsoft says there's sets of ML algorithms to solve problems in the field of AI. And that is pretty vague. And I think, I think that's intended because um, though I've worked more with the language one than any of the five, these are evolving so fast that I think the description's vague because of that. Because you know, maybe not every day, but maybe every week they're doing cooler and cooler things. Um, one important thing to know before we get into this, and the thing that I build is not built on this, but hopefully this kind of gets your mind going about solutions you could do that are that are way outside of what I've built, is these can all be consumed, can all be called through standard REST calls. So there's nothing, you know, there's no secret sauce here to talk to them. Um, they work in ways that if, if you know, whether you have any app dev background or have people on your team or at your firm that do, um, they can talk to these things in, in a way that's going to be pretty comfortable to them. So what are the APIs that Azure makes available to us now? So there are five. Vision, uh, which is really, really cool, and, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but it analyzes images and videos and you can pull sentiment out of those but it um, it does a lot more than that it pulls a lot of data out of those I'd love to give another talk about those and maybe someday I will it's not um, it's not really part of this but I want you guys to know kind of what's available because the the whole point of this talk well there are really two it's one to, to explain what I've done why I think it's cool and more importantly why I think it's important to you. Number two, I want people's minds to get going to know that this stuff is out there and think about problems that they can solve with it because, you know, how I got into this is basically that same thing. So after we've talked about vision, there is a speech one, there's a knowledge one, there's a search one, 
and then there's language, which is, which they say understands sentences and intent. And, and we'll talk about how that is and isn't true. Um, but the important thing here is basically what I'm going to talk about the rest of the time until the last slide. The language one is what all of this is built on. So why is this important? Well, first things first, new cycles used to last days, right? Um, you know, it was, it, go back, you know, maybe 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, things going viral, <laughs> if you go back far enough, it wasn't a term that anybody really knew of. Um, and as that started to evolve, uh, you know, I think kind of your average person didn't necessarily understand what that meant. And maybe media companies, things like that, didn't really understand what it meant. Now they all do. And now, and we see it in news, whether it's politics or sports or what have you, uh, news comes and goes quickly. And, you know, people these days are living on Facebook, Twitter, things like that. And that's where a lot of their, you know, that that's where word of mouth happens, basically. Um, and, and, you know, for our purposes, really, that's almost the only place that happens. And, and we'll talk later about why that is. And whether it's politics or sports or whatever, it's so easy to get on one of these platforms and, and say something that can then be immediately magnified, whether by other people or bots or things like that, that, you know, all of this stuff, it, let's say that people's outrage or or joy is kind of enhanced. It gets magnified very quickly, and that's something we want to be aware of and be on top of. Where this can go sideways is that whether it's you personally, which I hope has never happened, uh, but or a uh, company or something like that, being on the wrong end of, of a tweet or a post that's negative, whether it's towards a marketing campaign or, or a product or something like that, um, it, you know, it may seem funny to those of us that are outside of them, but there are, and, and the next two slides go into this, there are a couple examples where social media missteps were big issues and actually affected companies significantly. Um, and it's just, it's because they were a few steps slow in reacting to something they had done, basically. And if you take nothing else away from this slide, before we dive into why this is important, what I want us all to think about is that, you know, in, in much the same way, if we come from a DBA background, you'd want to baseline a server to understand, you know, when it's working normally, what do things look like? How much RAM does it use? How much CPU does it use? Things like that. If we, if we would do that with these, if social media sentiment is something that's important, to your company, and it most likely is, then we should baseline that. We should understand what that normally looks like when business as usual is going on, you know, where are we at? And so that way you can then react quickly to when you're not there. Whether it's good or bad, that's something you want to understand. You know, if it's good and people have a positive uh, vibe, then you want to know why and you want to keep doing that. And if it goes the other way, you want to know what you did. Um, and, and, you know, you want to be able to react quickly because these days you have to. You don't have a week. You have maybe a day. So here are a couple examples I've found. I know there, there are more. I thought these were interesting. If you guys have better ones, I would love to hear about those and kind of talk through why those are different than these. Um, one of the most interesting ones I found was a Dove body wash, and it was not a TV ad. It was apparently a Facebook ad only, and it was released in October of 2017. And the images and video that they ran with um, were perceived to be racist by many folks. And it took the brand, so that came out on Facebook. So they were well aware, they knew that the social media presence was important. It wasn't like it was a TV ad that came out from a creative arm that didn't do anything with social. It was it was a social campaign that, when you kind of look back to what happened, went went seriously wrong instantly. Um, and it and it 
took the brand nearly two days to offer a response that was more than just kind of a tepid, we messed up, we're not sure how. It, it, it's hard to get detailed information on exactly what they were looking at and why, but the reason this really stuck out to me is it seems like they were not aware of, of the sentiment of those posts at all, or they maybe had not baselined like we talked about on on the last slide that maybe maybe it was even something where you've just got your marketing team kind of looking through comments and maybe they didn't look at the right ones i mean i've uh, like i said i've i've talked to friends of mine that work in this field and sometimes the monitoring of this is no more advanced than that then hey go go look at the comments go look at our timeline make sure that people like this and maybe you know they clicked on posts where people said oh great ad when almost the rest of them weren't saying that. Um, so if if you had an electronic tool that could be easily built to kind of help you look at this, you would know you had deviated from, from your baseline. And with this particular one, they deviated significantly. So it's something where somebody just going out and looking and saying, how do people feel about this? That's not good enough, and it's not fast enough. This one was fascinating. I'll say it kind of predated where I, you know, I, I expected to find a lot of examples maybe from the last two or three years where it feels like almost everybody is using these tools. Um, this was Entenmann, so, you know, coffee cakes, donuts, things like that. In July of 2011, there was a not guilty hashtag that had to do with the Casey Anthony verdict. Uh, which was, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it was potentially she had murdered her child, and it was a it, it was a trial that was on all all the news and all that. And there was a not guilty hashtag, which the Entenmann social media director or person <laughs> decided to jump on in a very negative way. Um, the the tweet was more or less, I think it was advertising their cinnamon rolls. And it was saying, you know, hashtag not guilty if you try our new cinnamon. It just uh, completely fell flat, obviously. Um, in this case, they actually responded within 24 hours. But because it was on a hashtag dealing with an event in real life that was receiving so much media coverage and things like that, um, that response wasn't fast enough. They didn't realize what they had done. And they actually deleted their account from, it was hard to tell exactly when it was reinstated from what I could find, but it appears they had deleted it from July 2011 until at least the late fall. And there were even some articles I read, obviously they were not forthcoming with data on this, but there were even some articles I read that tied some bakery closings that they had done in that kind of the year between July 2011 and, and the next summer. Um, they had closed some bakeries and things like that, tying all of that into this, where their sales, as far as people could tell who analyzed these sorts of things, their sales had fallen off by percentage points. Um, and, and, they, and this was all dating back to a tweet that they, you could argue, definitely shouldn't have put out, but when they did, they did not recover from it fast enough. So are there any questions up to this point? Jason, I think we're roughly halfway through. Yeah, sorry about that. So I've got a couple questions here and uh, some commentary. Um, cool. One moment there. So the, the first one is, I've tried to post my sentiment about various products and I get no reply. How do you feel this is relevant and how do, how can they do, well, what can they do if it's negative? Why do you? That's it. That's cool. So this is, um, this actually ties into something that's, it's on really the last content slide, but I'm happy to take a minute to talk about it here. What I've done is, is kind of a silly soccer thing, but it, you guys understanding this framework, you'll see how you can do um, not silly things with it. And and we talked about why there are not silly things you should do with it. Um, there are ways through the Azure apps that I've used where 
you can below a certain sentiment score. So we talked about where like zero is really negative, one is very positive. Below a certain score, you can actually trigger a workflow to send an email to somebody. And so that's kind of an outgrowth, something that 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 is a practical thing that makes sense where, you know, if somebody, especially if you're if you're a small business and somebody just lights you up and says, I bought this thing from them and it's the worst thing I ever had, you know, if that's your livelihood, you're going to want to know. And there are, and it's fairly easy to do, you can set workflows in motion here where if a sentiment score comes in, let's say below 0.1, which is just going to be pretty rough. Um, it will email a person, a group, whatever, and then they can react personally to it. So hopefully that helps. It, it, and I'm happy to talk more about that or kind of field other questions about it. But yeah, there's cool stuff you can do spinning off this. Right, and, and along those same lines is how do leading tech companies use it? I post tweets to Adobe, Microsoft, Intel, and they go into black holes. Most of the people manning them can't do anything. Some seem manned by bots. So I think a lot of them are manned by bots, and as I've kind of gotten involved with this, and this is very much kind of a side job, uh, there, I do have one customer that does some stuff with this, uh, but most of this is just I'm, I'm enough of a nerd where I think this is cool and want to play with it off hours. Um, there is a lot of technology making it easy to create conversation bots and things like that, which kind of play in this realm as well. Um, I, I will say this, that I had a particular issue with this, and I'll talk about towards the end some issues that I'd like you to avoid where I didn't. Um, I spun up my Azure bill pretty hard the first week that I played with this because some things, I thought they worked one way, the documentation was vague, I was wrong. And I tweeted to Azure support one night and basically knew I was misunderstanding something and could, could see that it wasn't working the way I thought. And a bot answered me. And so I, you know, you could kind of tell it was. And so I responded back to it. It was then, and I responded back to it in a fairly negative way. I didn't curse them out or anything, but I said, like, I was really frustrated. This stuff's cool, and it's not working the way I was told. Um, I was then contacted by a person fairly immediately. So from an Azure support perspective, my guess is they're using their own stuff, kind of like I just talked about, where maybe sentiment below a certain thing or something like that. Hey, this person's unhappy, especially with things like this that are pretty new. And that, that immediately went into a flow where I was contacted by a person. And actually, the experience after that of getting my stuff working right and kind of understanding what happened the experience was fantastic. So I, there's a model there. Um, I, I will echo that. I've uh, Not every large company reacts to this the way that I wish they would. Um, Microsoft seems to have figured it out, <laughs> or at least parts of them. <laughs> okay, great. That's what we got for now. Do we have any? Okay, cool. Okay, so how did I get involved in talking about this stuff and thinking this stuff is cool. Um, this requires a little explanation. So if, you, if you're if you a soccer fan, you might have heard of these guys. Um, they have, I think it's like the fifth highest rated sports podcast on iTunes. Um, they were on ESPN during the 2014 World Cup. It's these two guys. Um, and that's me in their studio when I went to talk about how we we're going to use this for their podcast. And that's kind of what we're going to get into here. So these two guys, like I said, I think they go between like number four and number five and on, on iTunes with sports podcast. Um, they, so it's two guys with different backgrounds. Roger is a, is a writer, filmmaker. Michael, or, or Davo, as he's known, um, is actually a TV producer. He's done who wants to be a millionaire, um, a bunch of reality shows, things like that. He's been very successful with that. They've both been successful elsewhere, but they get a kick out of talking about soccer. <laughs> and so they created the podcast years and years ago. The TV show um, is on after Premier League matches, probably about once a week. Um, they, I think the show is three years old, 103 episodes, I think. So anyway, um, I had gotten into their stuff during the 2014 World Cup, 
and uh, there, if you take nothing else away from this talk, if you like goofy British humor, especially about sports, check these guys out. But anyway, I was driving to a customer in uh, mid-October, and they had a segment where they talked about how cool it would be to have a mood table for the English Top Flight League. Um, because if you follow it at all, at that point, there was a team that was running away with it. They still are. Um, and so they mused that the actual table, the, the actual standings, were no fun to talk about. They, they didn't know what they were going to talk about on, on the podcast when essentially the championship race had been ruined, you know, two months in, in a season by a team starting off so well. Um, neither one of these guys are technical at all. And so they, they kind of joked about it on this pod, like, oh, that, that would be awesome, and, you know, that'd be so cool. And then they kind of wrote it off, said, there, there's, there's no way to do this. I don't know why we're wasting time Talk about it, and went back into that stuff. So I was listening to that. And I had started kicking this stuff around a little, little tiny bit. And, and, and the next slide goes into kind of how I started with that. Um, and then I reached out to them and said, I actually think I know how to do this if you guys were serious. And they were nice enough to get back to me and basically said, prove it. Because I'm sure, you know, they're popular enough. I'm sure they get all manner of emails from goofy people suggesting goofy things. Um, so they said, well, you know, show us what you do for this particular match and, and I did and I sent it to him and it's been a regular feature on the podcast until the last couple weeks um, they had to move it off for some other stuff but it should be back uh, shortly so how did I know what this was so I used to work with a guy named Brad Ball who works at Microsoft now and he wrote a fascinating blog I think it was last August when this stuff was pretty much brand new um, and he was doing sentiment stuff on movies, trying to figure out, you know, what the sentiment of a movie is maybe from when the first trailer comes out to when it comes out in theaters to when, you know, maybe it's been out two or three weeks to when it starts coming off screens and trying to use that to predict box office and you know, maybe even toy sales and things like that. So his blog was, was just a single event. It, it, it would monitor usually whatever the official hashtag was, but it got me thinking. And so what this does, this is a mood table of the English top flight, so all 20 clubs, and it ranks the clubs by the sentiments of their fans on Twitter within 10 minutes, basically 10 minutes either side of the final whistle of a match. Where So if you're a fan and you're out at the bar or the pub watching it with your friends, you're going to turn to them and say, great match, lousy match whatever it gets those sentiments on Twitter and while you may not care about that at, as we kind of get into the guts here this is what's going to help you kind of build your own thing whether whether you're analyzing a single event a match most likely what it's going to be is a hashtag you know maybe your company is is marketing a new product, service, something like that, and they say, well, our official hashtag for it is this. A lot of times people will jump on those with their own comments on it. You know, love this, hate this, it's the worst thing ever, yada, yada, yada. So what the mood table is comprised of and, and what kind of a lot of these things, this is the way a lot of this would be wired up, whether you're doing standings or not, is Azure SQL database is storing all this data like I showed early on. You do need somewhere to store it. You could, I, you know, I could have stored it a lot of different places, but Azure SQL is uh, not only stable, fairly cheap for not staying. It's the only way. It was the way that worked best for me. And if we're coming from kind of a, a database background, that, that may be the thing that most of us are most comfortable with as well. So we're storing it there. What feeds the data is a logic app for all 20 clubs. And that logic app, and, it, and we're going to dive into this to kind of show you what that is. That logic app 
contains a connection to the Cognitive Services API language, like we talked about, and then I'm using Azure Scheduler job collection to organize all this and fire them off when they're supposed to. Um, and before I get into the rest of this, I'm going to deviate here for a minute and explain why the scheduling of this is so important or why the understanding of how the apps work is so important. So when I built this and I had chatted with Brad, both of our impressions based on his, his actually using it and then me using it as well and then reading the documentation was it the way it appeared to work, and you'll see this when I show it to you, is it appeared that it would check on an interval where you could say every 15 minutes go look and see you know they'll see the last few tweets run compile those score them shut down and the documentation kind of indicated that same thing that you could specify an interval where it would wake up do its thing sleep however what is not well documented but i now understand very well is that when you're looking at things that are very popular, whether it's international soccer clubs, or uh, or you know any sort of any sort of popular hashtag, Twitter handle, anything like that, the tweets almost don't stop. And when the tweets don't stop, the logic app only really goes back to sleep when it runs out of things to look at. If it never runs out of things to look at, it never stops, and it's constantly doing exactly what you've told it to. Hey, I saw a tweet that had this phrase in it. I need to go score it. I need to store it blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's how I spun up my first bill significantly. <laughs> so uh, definitely if you want to start playing with this, my takeaway for you is uh, is be on top of, you know, if it's just a single app and you're playing, make sure you disable it when you're done. Um, and if it's something where you want it to run on a schedule or something like that, um, Azure's scheduler has, has been a godsend for me. Um, I don't delve into it here because it, it gets pretty deep. But if you go to my blog, sequelatspeed.com, if you look for the, I, I think it's the Premier League Mood Table Deep Dive post, it goes into exactly how to wire this up. So you need to understand Azure Active Directory and things like that a little bit. Um, my, my blog does a pretty good job laying out what I did, and I hope it helps you guys out uh, and hopefully at least helps you save some money because um, my wife is definitely very unimpressed with that first bill. So when it comes out, what it looks like is is this. So I send the podcast uh, producer basically a kind of output that just has sentiment score and club name, and then they have it ranked based off that. So as you can see, the result doesn't necessarily matter. Um, you can see like Chelsea there drew, but their sentiment was very high because uh, it, it had been a pretty exciting match. They had tied it late. And the most interesting example of this that I can think of is there was a team who was way down the mood table one particular week, or who was way up on, on the mood table, even though they had lost, and it was not a good loss. And what I noticed when I delved into those tweets is they had honored a player that had played for them who had broken some kind of racial and ethnic barrier in English soccer and he had passed away and they had done what was regarded as a really nice tribute to him and all of the sentiment on Twitter basically people forgot the match had happened and just said it you know it was wonderful what they'd done so it's interesting to kind of delve into things from that way and see what makes people go um, there was another one there was a club that had played um, on a Sunday and it was actually a club that uh, Roger Bennett uh, was a fan of, um, they had looked off, and he emailed me as soon as the match ended and said, let's be last. Went and looked why their manager, there were a lot of rumors that he would be fired after this match, and after the performance, people were sure. So the sentiment of the tweet was positive. People saying, well, at least we don't have to watch this guy manage us anymore. Um, so it's pretty interesting, you, you you know, you're you're seeing the first thing like a soccer match or current events or something like that. You know, there's there's always more to it than you'd expect at first glance. Okay, 
So we've talked about some of this. I'll run quickly through it, and then I'll show you guys what this actually looks like. So what the database does, I've got a table, and you can kind of see that when I when, when I showed the raw data first. Um, I've got a table that stores sentiment score, the account it comes from, the location, which, which is user specified. So you can do some interesting things with that. Um, you know, if you wanted to kind of map these out and see where the tweets come from, you are relying on the user to accurately describe their location. So I've played around with some of this. It's really cool because for the most part, people are actually honest, you know, and put city, state, country, things like that. For the people who say on a bar stool or something like that, it's much less useful. Um, but so, so it pulls all of that. So there's a lot more that we could do with it than even the things that I've done. Um, and so once we get into the logic apps, which is really what makes this go, which also ties back to the question we had a few minutes ago, is if you wanted to trigger a response based off a sentiment score that was poor, how could you do that? The logic app is, is what makes all of this happen. So there, there's one per club. There's a trigger that we add um, that's titled when a new tweet is posted, which is exactly what it sounds like. It runs every time it sees a new tweet with the search string that you've handed to it. Um, it then feeds the tweet text, and you'll see this workflow here in a couple minutes, to the detect sentiment action, which is technically still in preview, but works quite well. And the final step from there is it inserts a row in the, into the Azure SQL DB, so I can do some things with it. Um, the original version of this actually streamed to Power BI as well. I took that down because it wasn't really um, necessary for, for what we were doing and it did incur a cost. Um, this is probably much more useful, useful in a corporate environment than the environment that I'm doing this in. So that's something I want you guys to be aware of, and it was not hard to do. You can stream this to Power BI. I don't blog about it, but uh, Brad's blog goes into detail on that if you want to see how to do that, and his blog is sqlballs.com. We're going to talk a little bit about the, we talked about why the scheduler is important, and we talked about that it uses Azure AD to authenticate it. You don't really have to have much knowledge of it. You have to have a very basic understanding, but my blog kind of shows you the gaps that I help fill in and points you to a blog that, that was excellent. That was a huge help to me as well. Um, the nice thing is the interface for it, it's not intuitive to set up, but my blog and the blog that I link you to um, kind of gets you through the part that's really tough. The scheduling interface, super, super easy, which is nice. And you also get out of this, you get some run history and things like that a little more conveniently than some of the cognitive services alerting and logging stuff. That can be a little bit hard to parse, um, where if you're running this from, the, from a scheduler, it's better. And it's a lot easier to read and kind of see what's going on with it. Demo time. So I know I've been saying the whole time when I show you this, that's now. So let's go ahead and uh, take a peek at this. So this is a logic app for one of the clubs. And there we go. And it's actually the club that I support, Tottenham. Uh, and so what we've got here is the search text. So this... So you can see, now that I've hovered over it, what the tooltip says. Um, you can now search on hashtags. When I originally started doing this, you couldn't have the hashtag character in it. Um, it so I pointed it at the club's official handles. But if you're doing something on, on like a marketing campaign or something like that, being able to specify a hashtag is really important. Um, you can now put the hashtag character in front of it, which helps your data be a little cleaner. And, um, you know, almost, it seems like almost anything now has a hashtag tied to it, and this helps you analyze that pretty easily. So there's the search text. Unfortunately, and I, I've got to think this will change. It hasn't changed yet. You cannot do multiple search texts within a logic app. You couldn't say Spurs official or Tottenham or Spurs. You can just do this. If you want multiple search texts, you do need multiple logic apps. Um, not a big deal if you're trying to analyze on a particular hashtag or your company's Twitter handle or something like that. Uh, but if you're going for something a little broader, you need to understand, you need the logic app per search phrase. 
this is the interval that I spoke about earlier. Um, it, as I said, it's documented in that this is how often it will run. It even says that here, how often do you want to check for items? Important to consider, especially if you're looking at a popular handle or hashtag, like I said, if it never stops seeing things, it never goes to sleep. So this, do not put all your trust in, in this. <laughs> um, and all it takes for this to run is actually a connection to, you know, for instance, this is my personal account here that it runs off of. Uh, but that's it. There's, there's not much more to it than that. So you can see this workflow comes down here into the, the text sentiment action, which is in preview. And what it does, so there's, there's a bunch of fields like we've talked about, that this trigger can feed down through through the workflow, whatever you want to have it do. Um, I'm just feeding the tweet text here. You could sentiment analyze any text, but obviously I, I want the text of the tweet. Um, it, one interesting thing is if you start to get into the vision API a bit, and there's there are some OCR related things you can make there. You can pull text out of photos and analyze the text of those as well. Um, obviously, I don't show that here, but it's something kind of cool to think about and, and might apply to your use more than mine. So I've fed the tweet text to it here. And then what it does is this actually automatically converted it to a for each loop. Um, so I took the user mention. So for a soccer match, what you see a lot of is somebody might tag both clubs in it. And I wanted the ability to kind of isolate tweets by club. So what this does, because I'm, um, you know, because I'm inserting a row and then kind of separating it by user mentions, it'll actually insert a row, a separate row for each handle mentioned. So depending on your use, that may or may not be useful. Uh, but if you're trying to break out tweets that have a lot of handles tagged in them, you want to kind of separately analyze those, that's one way to do it. And then this is an insert row operation that simply inserts that data. Uh, before we flip back over to the database, I do want to show you guys the scheduler stuff because it's, um, it's incredibly helpful. And so let's come down here and look at all that. And... Okay, so this is a scheduler job collection because I had to run 20 of these and I needed an enable and disable job because you want it to start and stop. Um, you know, I've actually got 40 jobs here. This is fairly affordable. I think it's about 13 bucks a month and you can have up to 50 jobs. So it fit me quite well. So let's say we'll go ahead and look at this and you can see the scheduling interface over here. So it pulls up all this stuff and there's there's a lot of monitoring and logging you can go look at. What we really care about is the scheduling interface here. So I go to add a specified time and that's it. There's no more to it than that. Like I said, you, you can go to my blog to figure out how to wire this up. That part was no fun. This part's easy. Um, and so this, they, you know, once you get it going, this stuff's pretty cool to play with. Let's quickly flip back over to the database. Maybe this will make more sense now that we've talked about it a bit. So the fields, there are more fields available. What I'm capturing here is is the username, the actual text of the tweet. Um, I take the description. I'm not really doing anything with it yet, but I hope to. And you can see there's some good examples here. The people that have specified locations generally behave themselves and gave me something useful if I wanted to kind of map that out. Um, We've also got some things, so it's got the score. We have followers as well. What I'm not capturing yet, but probably would for commercial applications of this, is you can see retweet counts and things like that. And that becomes important where do you want to filter out bot, uh, bots or not, basically. So for something like this, we don't want bots. So I'm kind of filtering that out behind the scenes now. Um, but if you're doing... If you're analyzing something for a marketing campaign or something like that, you may care if bots are magnifying either positive or negative things, and you want to be aware of that and kind of see the guts of what that score is. You know, maybe your sentiment score has gone down, but maybe it's not actually people driving that. So let's bring this home here. We've got about six minutes left. So what's next? So 
for the silly soccer stuff I've done, um, what we're talking about doing possibly, this is not for sure yet, is we may go back to the Power BI live sentiment stuff during some World Cup matches this summer where you could actually map the sentiment. Like if you've ever watched like a political debate or speech or something like that where they have the people sitting in a room and say, you know, turn the dial right if you really like this, turn the dial left if you, if you hate this. We may do something similar with matches to kind of see and even isolate it by country, you know, to see how people are reacting in real time to that. And it might provide some interesting talking points, especially if the match itself is kind of boring. This middle bullet point is something I'm really excited about and hoping to find more time to do. There are ways to use Python to kind of scrape past tweets. You can use Twitter's advanced search to do that. And then you can use the Azure ML stuff to score those tweets. To do, there are There's some sentiment scoring ability you can get to within that toolkit. Um, and then potentially you can actually give it different semantic libraries. So if you're analyzing something that has specific jargon with it, this might be a way where you can make the you can make the sentiment score better by applying your knowledge that maybe kind of the canned stuff that I'm using doesn't. Um, I'm also doing some things to hopefully work with some US-based clubs to map the sentiment, which on its own is maybe only interesting to things like fan response, souvenir sales, things like, you know, things that really impact a club's bottom line versus just a silly podcast thing. So what about the non-silly things you can do? It? So this is why I said kind of one of the last slides goes back to one of the questions we got during our halftime break, is you can actually use an Azure function to alert however you want, whether it's an email or, or a Facebook message or you know, something somewhere, hey, we need to respond to this. We've received something that's very negative and we need to jump on that. If you're a big company, you know, maybe you'd want to be less reactive to an individual message because odds are there's probably are always somebody out there who thinks like Coke is lousy or doesn't like Fords or something like that. If you're a smaller business, you may really want to jump on that. Um, you could also do a sentiment dashboard based on the stuff that we've talked about using Power BI instead of going out and buying something. Um, you know, this is kind of all in your hands and you can customize it and make it be exactly what you would want. Your marketing folks are likely to be pretty interested in that, especially if they've been asking for a tool, one of the off the shelf tools and say, well, boy, that's cool and it would be helpful, but it's too expensive. You can give them a lot of that now and it's, and it's not too expensive. Another thing you could do is report back to this based off geography. So if you're a national company and you want to kind of see by region where are you received positively, negatively, things like that, that's some cool, helpful stuff that doesn't have to do with soccer. Last slide. Um, so what do I want you guys to kind of take away from this? If your company, whether it's yours or where you work or whatever, if you have a social media presence and you rely on that to sell things, you need to analyze the sentiment. You need to know what people think of you. That's, that's key these days. You, if you don't know, it's eventually going to bite you, even if you've done something well-meaning that you think was okay. So if your marketing folks aren't on top of this, take away from this talk an encouragement to start looking at this because we've got a lot more tools to do it, and it's a lot easier to do. Um, as data pros, we have a role in this, especially if your organization is smaller. Um, you know, we, we can assist, we can provide that value in a way other than keeping the server running, making sure our backups run, things like that. This is something that's within our ability to do. Um, if you're not interested in machine learning at all, now's the time to start to get interested in it. Um, it's, it's the underpinning of so much that goes on around us and the underpinning of so much of what we do even as data pros. Final takeaway, if you take nothing else away, is I'm a big enough dork that I built something like this to rank soccer teams based on people's feelings. And on that note, Jason, I think I left us about 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, we're right, at, we're right at the edge of time here. Uh, I, there is about six questions. Um, I'm going to just grab those and send them over to you. You can uh, reply back and 
Um, it, I believe it does have the email address of the person that asked the question, so you can respond back to them and let them know uh, the answer to those questions. Okay. And yeah, on, on that note, I've got my contact info up. If you want to email me directly, you can do that. Otherwise, I'll take those six and I'll blog about them, hopefully in, in the next week or so, and that'll be at SQL at speed .com. All right. Sounds great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Our next session is two Thursdays from today, and hope to see most of you there, or actually all of you there. Um, so thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, all.